I am honored to be here today with all of you, bringing forth the Word of God. And um, it's just a just an awesome place to be. So let's let's bow our heads in prayer for a moment. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that your word is alive and living. We thank you, Lord, as we go through the logos of your word, that your spirit will touch it and bring a rhema to each one of us. We thank you for your light that shines upon the word, that washes us and makes us ready, Lord, for your soon return. We love you and we dedicate, Lord God, our lives to you each and every day. In Yeshua's name, amen. Okay, so we are still currently in the month of Elul. And so for those uh, who, who aren't real familiar with this season, I'd like to begin with a brief history of this special month of remembrance of God's grace and mercy. We don't forget... We want to continually bring it to the forefronts of our minds and talk about it. That's what the Lord tells us to do. Bring it, bring his word and talk about the wonderful things that he has done for us. And this is a month where we talk about God's mercy and his grace. So it goes back to the time of Moses. And it's in the first year after the Israelites have been delivered out of Egypt. Seven weeks later, the people of Israel received the Torah at Mount Sinai, and they were delivered out of Egypt. Forty days later, just 40 days later, while Moses was still up on the mountain, they didn't think he was coming back. And what they did is they disobeyed God by making a golden calf. They erected an idol, and they started worshiping it. When Moses finally came down the mountain and witnessed the sin of idolatry, he smashed the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. He then returned for a second 40 days to plead with God for the people of Israel. He went up a third time for God to reinscribe the Ten Commandments and remain there for 40 days. This is when he went up from the first of Elul to the tenth of Tishrei. And we know the 10th of Tishrei is Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. And during this time, he obtained God's forgiveness and rec reconciliation for the people of God. So this is the time we're in to right now. Today is actually the 25th of Elul on the biblical calendar. We're coming in. The month is coming to an end. We generally have Rosh Kadesh this Wednesday, but it is a feast that begins on the new moon. And it's uh, Yom Teruah, the day of shouting. And, um, and we just remember that uh, this is a season, that everything is a shadow of the Lord. And it's an honor. Who knows it's an honor to, to know and learn these things and then do them, right? Amen. So there's a couple things in the month of Elul that I just kind of wanted to point out. This, my, whole month, my whole message is not going to be on this. I'm going to move into something else. But the first part of the message, I just wanted to talk about a couple different things. Um, so the month of Elul is a reminder for us as believers to always be in a state of preparation, looking up for the coming of the Lord. In Matthew 24, 36, Yeshua tells us, but of that day and hour, no one knows not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We prepare ourselves by getting to know our Lord in an intimate way, just like Moses did when God showed him his glory. When he was intimate with the Lord and the Lord put him in the cleft of the rock and his presence passed by him, he was changed. His countenance changed. And when we are in his presence and we're in that intimate relationship with him, our countenance changes. The month of Elul is also the time to turn back to God because he is compassionate. It's God's power of forgiveness that's revealed to us through regret and sorrow of the sins that we have committed against him that brings us back to right relationship with him. 
In this way, we allow God's law to illuminate our sins and to teshuva, to see our sin and turn away from it with a change of mind that only comes from a place of true brokenness. That is what restores us back to the fullness of our salvation and an improved spiritual state of kingdom life and blessings. The prophet Joel instructs us how we are to turn back to God. He says, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Another point I want to bring up is the spiritual law of seed time and harvest in the aspect of when we sow seeds of repentance, we will reap a harvest of righteousness. The reason I bring this up is because if we truly want to become the righteousness of God, we will find ourselves in a difficult situation struggling with repentance. Think about it. If we're living a righteous life in our own eyes, being the good Christian, doing our Bible study, doing the things that Christians do, and we're, we're a righteous people in God, why do we need repentance? We don't, because everything we're doing is right. So my point is, repentance is an active work of God. And righteousness is the result. Repentance is the seed that we sow, and righteousness is the harvest. We should always desire repentance, and in that, righteousness will come. So how do we sow seeds of repentance? Well, generally, we start, uh, we start our day by praying, getting into the presence of the Lord, dedicating our day to him, asking him to come, shine his light on our feet and our path so we know what he wants us to do, we prepare ourselves for the day, and whatever he has for us, we, we get filled with his spirit on the inside so that when we go out, and whether it be in the workplace or if we're with our children or whatever it is that we're doing, then we are filled up with God to accomplish what he has called us to accomplish. But at night, when we end our day, it's, and we bring our praises and our thanksgiving to the Lord for the way he helped us through the day, that is a good time to meditate and think about maybe some of the attitudes and actions that we had during the day may not have been what God wants. This is where the gift of speaking in tongues is needed. Rabbi Allen uh, just went through the gifts of the Spirit, and when he preached on speaking in tongues, it was a glorious service. So many people received the gift that day. And what is so important about that is, it, is we edify ourselves. We build us up in our most holy faith in our prayer closet, and it's needed. And so when we're worshiping the Lord and we're praying in the Spirit, even if we don't know how to repent or what to repent because we're just living life and, and, and we just don't know how to do that, when we're praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit knows what to pray for us about. And so, and so the Spirit, like through our sighs and our moaning and our crying and our tears, these are acts of repentance because when we... Uh, approach the Lord in this manner, we are cleansed. A cleansing happens. And then we're ready to be filled up and go do it again the next day. Amen. It's just like the priest. The priest came into the temple with their mourning offerings and sacrifices to the Lord. And then in the evening, they came and did it again. That is what we do in our relationship with the Lord. Traditionally, during Elul, Psalm 27 is read twice daily as an important part of spiritual preparation for the high holidays. As we read through this psalm, 
we will recognize the Lord's goodness and mercies revealed to us in different characteristics of his name. So if you brought your Bible today, if you could turn to Psalms, Psalm 27. And what we're going to do, we're going to build precept upon precept, line upon line. And we're going to get to know God in an intimate way today. We're going to get to know him with the characteristics of who he is and different names that he is called. All right. Everybody there? Okay. So verse 1. The Lord is my light. No, actually, before I get started, real quickly, I'm going to spend a, a good portion on this first verse. And um, the rest of it will go kind of quickly. But there's something important in this first verse that God wants to reveal to us. So we're going to spend a little bit more time in this verse. So it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That's part one. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So when we begin with the Lord is my light, he is our light. He is Jehovah Ori. And I, I've got slides here. There we go. And the light, he is our light. He is Jehovah Ori. His light directs us in the way of life. Psalm 119, 105 reveals this attribute perfectly by the words, by stating, and this is in the message, and I love the way the message puts this. It says, by your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. Jehovah Orai provides the light that is needed to determine the right direction to go by guiding and leading us through his tr with the truth of the word. In this season, we can identify my light to be associated with Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, the light of Israel that begins the 10 days of awe. And what does the number 10 represent? Anybody know? Divine appointment, that's right. It's, it's a supernatural invitation to invite the Holy Spirit to set a fire of truth in our hearts for true repentance with the fruit of restored fellowship and intimacy. So this is a good time. If you've at all been feeling a little distant in your relationship with God, this is the season for your divine appointment. Jewish tradition shows that the 10 days of awe is, is the days where the heavens are open and we are the closest we can get to him through the whole year. But we know the truth is we have Yeshua and he, we are close to him any time we desire to do that. The minute we call on his name, he comes rushing to meet us. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Remember, salvation means deliverance. It's throwing off everything that hinders us and that sin that so easily entangles us. In other words, if your sorrow is towards God, recognizing that all sin is against his holiness, and if it's from a true unselfish motive, it will lead us into true repentance, turning back to God and reaping an improved spiritual state of righteousness. If you know, I know I've gone through seasons where I felt like there's just something there. There's something there that has to be dealt with. I don't know what it is. But God knows what it is. And so when we take it to the Lord, he is there to shine his light on it and help us to, to go through true repentance. But if we allow remorse and regret to remain through self-centeredness, bringing misery and death to our souls, 
then we will experience a separating of fellowship and intimacy from the Lord. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27 says, Just as Christ gave himself for the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. If you are looking to be in the first fruits rapture that Rabbi Allen is always talking about, I'm telling you, he's coming for a bride that has been washing in the water of the word, scrubbing out the spots of moral flaws and releasing the wrinkles through deliverance from visible flaws in our character. Interesting, interesting there, that word spot and wrinkle, it takes on the picture of when, when do we get spots on our garments? When we're eating, right? And we drop something on our blouse or our shirt, and now we have a spot, we got to get it out. And that, that is talking about our moral flaws. It's talking about we're giving into our flesh and we're not paying attention. We're not, you know, eating correctly. We're just slopping the food around and dropping and making spots on our garments. And God doesn't want us to do that with the word. He wants us to carefully examine and, and, and eat his word. His word is food to us. And then that word wrinkle there is like wrinkles on our face. So have you ever seen a grumpy old man, you know, and all those wrinkles? That is the outward, um, uh, that is the outward uh, signs that there needs to be a cleansing and a repentance or something. There's a work that needs to be done in the heart. So you got to look around. No, just kidding. I have wrinkles, but they, we, they have apps for that. <laughs> So you take your picture and erases all your wrinkles. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. <laughs> so Yeshua is coming for a bride. His bride is someone that he wants to be intimate with. And he's looking for a holy and pure bride, pure from the sins of carnal and worldly, pre worldly pleasures without reproach. You know, I heard it once spoken of before that, you know, when we stand before the Lord and, Lord, Lord, I knew you. I did all these things for you. And how sad would it be if the Lord didn't know us and he looked at us and said, I don't know who you are. So are we doing all these Christian things to, for the God or are we in a true intimate relationship getting to know the Lord? And I'm hoping today going through the names of God is going to help us with that. The second slide is the Lord is my salvation. Again, salvation, the Lord our deliverer. He is Jehovah Mephalti. One of the Hebrew words for mercy is rachamim, which is plural. When we ask for God's mercy to forgive our sin, he gives us rachamim, mercies overflowing, to wash over our every sin, to wash over all of our failures with mercies to spare. And doesn't he tell us that they're new every day? That's rachamim. Second Chronicles 39, 30 verse 9 states, for if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So my salvation is can be associated with Yom Kippur when the sacrifice of a perfect lamb, Yeshua, who shed his blood for the remission of our sin, 
when the names of those whose sins are forgiven and are written in the Lamb's book of life, delivered out of death into life with victory. Amen. Simon Peter recognized Jehovah Elohim Yeshua, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, in Matthew 16, 16, through whom we have accepted salvation and deliverance. Now, in the first part of this scripture, I kind of broke it into two parts. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? I want to talk about that portion of that scripture. The Lord's light and salvation is available to us for our protection before we sin. Okay? So when we become afraid of something or someone, he is there in our midst with his truth and deliverance to help us face our problems, not to flee from them. This is key. This is, this is key to understand. We're to turn to the word whenever we have a, a trial or a problem or something that comes. We are to turn to the word first. Face our problems and then salvation, deliverance from our problems comes. But if we don't do that, so, so God is available there in the way before we sin. He's there with his word and with his light to deliver us before we get into sin. So sometimes if we're not going to the word or allowing him to deliver us from our situation and we're turning from him, generally that's when we move into sin. This is his compassion towards us in helping us not to sin. His word helps us to see where we are going and will confront temptation for us. And then his compassion delivers us from it. In this instance, sin is only committed if we are confused or if we're blind to the fact that what we're doing is wrong. Help is available. Jehovah Ori and Jehovah Mephalti is there for us before we sin. The next part in that scripture, the Lord is the strength of my life. He is Elohe Mausi. This is the characteristic of God that we call upon when we are weak. We are asking the Lord to accomplish more in our lives than we could ever imagine. Have you ever heard someone say, it must be God because there is no way I could do this, right? That is Elohe Mausi. That is his strength. When we are feeling helpless and vulnerable, we know that God is a place of security. He is our stronghold. He, he stands beside us, defending us and raising us up to where we belong even when we don't think we deserve it. He's defending us against the lies of the enemy, and we are justified through the blood of Yeshua. The God of our strength puts the super on our natural, and we become champions in him. And this is all after we have betrayed him in sin. You see, the strength comes from the notion of fear that is transferred to shame after we sin, meaning when we sin, we have the fear of the Lord rises up in it. His spirit gives us the fear of the Lord that causes us to feel bad and to feel guilty. And it causes us to turn to the Lord. It's in that moment of disgust with our sin that the fear of the Lord shows up and becomes the strength of our life. So when we pray for strength, God will give us an opportunity to be tested in our weakness. But don't worry. Don't not pray for strength because he is there. He is our strength. 
We need to let him in. He is strong and we are weak. So this is speaking of the sin that we know we're doing wrong. But we didn't have the strength to resist it. The Lord is the strength of my life. And God tells us that he loves us even though he was there to help us. Remember, he was throwing down beams of light on our path and waiting for us to get the revelation of his truth so that he could rush in and deliver us out of it. But that doesn't always happen. God won't allow us to sever our relationship with him because he knows that guilt and shame can cause that to happen. So he gives us a higher level of love, which is his strength to repent. Because when we are in sin, do we have the strength to repent? We don't. It is, it is his love, it is his characteristics that gives us the strength to do that, to teshuva. This is God's provision to provide us with the ability to teshuva, and not only to teshuva, but to do it with joy. He's going to throw some joy in there too for us. That's how much he loves us. He does this because his compassion is so deep that it gives us more of a strengthened relationship that is stronger than the innocent relationship that was never touched by betrayal. Is that an amazing God or what? That is just so deep. It's just amazing to me. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back to Psalm 27 and read verse 2. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. So when we're in the brokenness and lowly of mind, and oppression starts to descend upon us, and then what happens the enemy will start sending people your way to attack you, right? The welfare of our body is prone to weakness and sin, causing us to fail and to be overthrown. This is what David was talking about here. We, we are weak and frail. God knows that. You know how many times in my prayers I tell God, Lord, remember, you made me from the dust. Actually, you made me from a rib. <laughs> I mean, really, you are God. I am, I'm rib. <laughs> Verse 3, though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. So he's saying here, when I get overwhelmed, in my heart, this is where the seat of courage is. It's in our hearts. Our, it rises up. The courage rises up. And we allow it to, and we don't let our emotions make us afraid. We cannot trust our emotions. I'm sure we all know that, right? Right? We trust the truth and the word of God, not how we're feeling. And then when the battle is raging, we have no cause to fear because we've taken courage in the Lord. Verse 4, one thing have I desired, one thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing have I desired of the Lord. The Lord is near. He is Elohe Mikarov. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24 says, Am I not a God near at hand and not a God far off? Can anyone hide out in the corner where I cannot see him? Am I not present everywhere 
whether seen or unseen. When the Lord is our desire, we can seek the face of God and draw near to him in prayer. Not only will we get filled in his presence, but he is also satisfied. We worship him in spirit and in truth, and we are heard by him. When we diligently seek him, we will find him. Yes, when we get serious about finding him, that's the key there. Are we serious about finding him? And when we do, when that's more important to us than anything else in life, he will make sure that he will not disappoint us. He says, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord. All right, so the second part of verse 4, the beauty of the Lord. The Lord is my glory. He is Jehovah Kavodi. The beauty of the Lord is filled with the brightness of his glory. When King Solomon dedicated the temple to God and the priests left the holy place, then a cloud filled the temple and because of the cloud of the glory of God, they weren't able to carry out their priestly duties. I can only imagine the weighty thickness of this cloud that would not even allow them to stand in his presence. There is nothing that compares to worshiping God and the beauty of his presence, ascribing glory that is due to his name is like a sweet incense that rises up to his nostrils. That is how he partakes of us. We partake of him, and he partakes of us as a sweet incense. He is pleased as we worship in spirit and in truth, so he begins to descend upon us. The heavens open above us, and we are instantly in his presence. The atmosphere changes, and in the brightness of his glory... Everything, in world, everything around us in the world grows dimmer and dimmer. We receive the fullness of joy, and we are given the power of strength to overcome. That's why when we come in here and we worship together, how many know when we leave here, we are strengthened, we are filled up, we are ready to go be champions, right? Okay, verse 5. One thing, excuse me, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, and the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. He shall hide me in his pavilion. The Lord is my shelter and my refuge, he is Jehovah Mishai. In our day-to-day -day life, when the danger of a storm begins to rage against us, we trust in the Lord and we find shelter in him. He promises us that he inhabits and dwells in the midst of our praises. That is why we praise him in the storm. The psalmist tells us, that God is a safe place to hide, ready to help when we need him. We can stand fearless at the edge of a cliff of doom, full of courage in sea storms and earthquakes, before the rush and roar of oceans and the tremors that shift mountains. As we have recently experienced some of these birth pains, birth pains taking place in the earth. And we know there are more to come because we know this is just the beginning. But take your place in Jehovah Mishai. For when you run into his shelter, you will be safe, protected, and covered in his presence. That reminds me of a vision I had one time when I saw a tsunami coming. And 
the wave was so big, it was above all these skyscrapers. And it was coming, and I stood there, and I looked at it, and I said, so this is it. This is it. And I didn't fear. I actually had joy. How crazy is that? The world cannot understand that. But I know you can understand that. And as I stood there, here came the wave, and it engulfed me. And I remember looking up, and I knew I wasn't going to get to the top. It was so far up. But I saw the light and the glory of God, and I was filled with joy, and I didn't have fear, and, and I could breathe, and I wasn't scared, and I was fine. I was safe. I was safe. That was the most amazing feeling. I could still, when I, I had that vision a long time ago, and I still when I talk about it, I, I feel like I'm in that place. That is Jehovah Mishai. That is his shelter. That is our refuge. And we really need to get to know him in that way, especially during these times. The second part of verse 5, he shall set me up upon a rock. The Lord is my rock. He is Jehovah Salai. He hides us in the cleft of the rock where we are safe from our enemies. When we find ourselves in a place where the enemy comes in like a flood, we can call upon the name of the Lord, Jehovah Salai, and the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against that enemy and rescue us. He really is our knight in shining armor. He is the eternal rock to where we run for dear life and we are protected under the covering of his presence. He lifts us up to a high place where he defends us and he guards us. We are his precious treasure. Don't you ever think that you are not his precious treasure. It doesn't matter what the world says we are. All that matters is who God says we are. And get this in you. Get this in your mind and your heart. So when people are used against you and they start telling you and, and making you feel worthless, you're just... It's not going to affect you because you have the truth of who you are. You know who you are. We live in the blessed assurance of his eternal protection. Psalm 61, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I for you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Wow, what a promise. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. Exalted be the God of my salvation. Psalm 1846. Does anybody know that old song? When I first met Brian, see, he was born again, spirit-filled believer. I was not. I was saved, but I was not spirit-filled. And the things that he talked about, I, I loved. I, I, it, I was so fascinated by it. And, every, and after we got married, we had a very quick marriage. We, we got married very quickly after we met. And um, every night before I went to sleep, he sang that song to me. The Lord liveth, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. And I felt so secure and safe in that. And I just felt the arms of the Lord coming around us. So that, that is one of my most awesome memories. So, Brian, you need to start singing that song to me again. <laughs> just because we've been married for 21 years, you know. All right, verse 6. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. The Lord is my banner. I will sing praises to him. He is Jehovah Nisi. 
In Exodus 17, after the children of Israel complained against the Lord in the wilderness, the attack of the Malachites came. Moses stood up on the top of a hill with a rod in his hand. And while the men went out to fight, when Moses held up his hand, Israel was strong and prevailed. And when he let down his hand, the enemy prevailed. His hands grew weary, and Aaron and Hur held up Moses' hand, hands until sunset, when the enemy was finally defeated. And after that happened is when Moses built an altar and called it Jehovah Nisi. When we find ourselves in a place of spiritual dryness, discouragement, and defeat, we can turn to God in faith. Instead of complaining and grumbling about our situations and circumstances, why not lift up the name of the Lord, rejoicing in God's promises, exalting him in who he is? Because when we really look at the situations, the things we get so worked up about, they're like nothing. I'm like, did I really just get upset about that? I don't. In comparison to, to everything I have in God, Oh, I don't want that wrinkle. <laughs> in worship, we can lift up holy hands in prayers of intercession to the Lord. Or we can raise a banner with music and song and instruments and dance. In praise dance, you will see flags and scarves lifted up to the Lord, symbolically declaring that we are strengthened encouraged and victorious in Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Both flags and hands can be used to lift up as a standard against our enemies and put them to flight. I've personally experienced so much in the Lord when I have lifted up his name as Jehovah Nisi. And I know many of you here have also experienced him in that way. Amen? Okay, verses 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. David is saying, Shema, hear, understand, obey the Lord. Call out to him. And show mercy and gracious and favor towards me. Pay attention to me, Lord. Respond to my needs. It's okay to say that to him. David was good at calling out on the names, Lord. Verse 8, when thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Seek my face. The Lord is there. When I seek his face, he is Jehovah Shema. When we look for God and pursue him with all of our heart, he is there. He is in this circumstance. He's in every circumstance. He is there. This isn't an effort to seek him because he's lost, because we know he's not lost. We're not seeking him for that reason. But he can be hidden from us or veiled if we allow obstacles of sin to hinder us. We can continually seek him by setting our mind and affections on him, calling and pleading, Lord, open my eyes, pull back the curtain of my own blindness, have mercy and reveal yourself to me. I long to see your face and know your presence. God is there in that very moment, and he's already there in our tomorrow. Did you know that? It, that's comforting, right? He even knows what our future looks like because he is there too. In Jeremiah 29, 11, Jehovah Shabbat says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. We cannot be in our future now, but we can rest in the fact that God is there. 
Verse 9, hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. The Lord saves. He is Jehovah Hashiach. David speaks of the assurance of God's saving work in Psalm 20, telling us that God answers us in the day of our trouble and that his name defends and delivers and rescues us, bringing us into victory. When we call upon Jehovah Hashiach for his saving grace to come in to the situation that has us bound, he will set us free, no longer bound to sin, but delivered into eternal happiness. As his anointed, he seats us far above principalities and powers, and he frees us from oppression of the devil. If you notice, I said, as his anointed. And I'm, and I'm on this, I, I taught on this this morning in Bible study. It is his anointing that comes upon us that, that brings us up above the storm, up above the principalities and powers. And he, and, that's, and he frees us from all oppression of the devil. It's vital to know and understand the truth of our salvation and what is rightfully ours. Because there are too many people of God walking around in defeat, walking around in oppression. They need the revelation. If you see your brother or sister like that, I pray that you have the revelation to go to them and bring them up out of the miry muck. Because, you know, we all get weak. We all get in these places, and we need each other to help us. Verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, and the Lord will take me up. Basically, he's saying that his father and his mother deserted him because he was wretched and poor. It's just speaking of a human person cannot help us. They will desert us. They can't help us when we are wretched and poor. But the Lord will take us up. He will bring us in and take us in into his secret place and give us what we need. Verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Here the Lord is my shepherd. He is Jehovah Rohi. The Lord is the shepherd and we are his sheep. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. In 2 Samuel, God sent Nathan to rebuke David for striking down Uriah and taking his wife Bathsheba to be his own. He rebuked David by telling him a story about the intimacy of love that a shepherd has for his sheep. And the story reads like this. It says, Nathan said to David, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and he grew up with him and his children. It shared his food drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. This little ewe was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the little lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Out of the mouth, David said, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan 
said to David, you are that man. Yeshua is our Jehovah Rohi, and as the good shepherd, he made the ultimate sacrifice for us. He laid down his life for the protection of his sheep. He lovingly gazes down upon us, caring and providing for our every need, tending to us, gently picking us up when we need us, when we need it, carrying us close to his heart. That is the picture that God of love of God has towards us. Jehovah Rohi is where we find the most tender, most intimate relationship there can be between God and his people. Verse 12. Deliver me not unto deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me and such as breathe out cruelty. So basically he's asking the father don't give me over to the slaughter and revenge of my enemies because of their untrue testimonies that are rising up against me as a witness against me, breathing out wickedness and oppression towards me. And then verse 13, he says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The Lord is God of my kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. He is Elohe Chazdi. God's desire towards us is translated through the words mercy, loving kindness, goodness, and faith, faithfulness, but they're not as they seem. When we read these words in the Psalms, they generally make us feel satisfied that God's words are zealous towards us. They are, but not in the way that we think. You see, before Elohi Chazdi comes, there is a duration of rebuke that happens. Upright are the wounds of a friend that comes from sincerity of mind, and wounds are used for a severe rebuke. But David tells us, to faint not, but consider the goodness of the Lord. So when we are being wounded, in the, in the verse before, verse 12, he was asking, don't let the wickedness of my enemies come upon me. But how many times do we know that there is, uh, when, when we do something, there can be circumstances that happens because of our choices. And God forgives us and loves us. But a rebuke from the Lord can come. And it will come. And we do get rebuked. And sometimes out of these rebukes, it leaves wounds. But God, Elohe, Chazdi, he floods us then with his goodness and his mercy and his kindness. The Lord also tells us that with the merciful, he shows mercy. And with the upright, he shows himself upright. And with the pure, he shows himself pure. And interestingly, what that means is if you are merciful and he shows himself mercy, it's a picture that is showing a loving God bowing his neck down to us in courtesy to us. What a picture of love that is. His loving kindness. When you read that word loving kindness, imagine the Lord bowing down his neck to be your equal. This is, to me, like a friend. You know, a friend comes. In both instances, the rebuke of a faithful friend and the courtesy of bowing down face to face, he is showing himself as a friend to us. And finally, in verse 14, it says, Wait, Ex expect Jehovah, excuse me, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. 
wait, I say, on the Lord. He is telling us to expect him to come and help us, to fix our eyes on him with hope, to grow strong and to prevail in him, grow strong in our minds. Who knows that our minds can take us off in the wrong directions. We have to strengthen our minds and our inner man, our heart, our soul, our understanding, and we wait upon the Lord. So that is Psalm 27. As this was a, a, a good psalm to meditate on for the month of Elul. And uh, praising the Lord for all.